So hi, hi everyone, welcome to the first Hacker School and its introduction to Python. And this is the first of the many series of Python workshops. So like for example, next week we have like automation to Python. So um, please look forward to that. So before we begin, let me introduce the speakers. So myself, I am Ashley and I'm a year three like DJA student. And we also have Chongyi who, who is a year two comm science student. So we'll be teaching you Python for today. And and the very purpose of Hacker School is to get you started on programming and making stuff and so that you can move on to start on your own projects. And disclaimer, we're not a coding camp, but, but I, know this, I know this is like outdated, but we are an interactive workshop both of online and offline. Yeah. So um, the main objective today is to obviously learn basic programming Python and you can be more familiar enough with Python to explore on your own. And the best way to learn, there are several ways, there are several ways to do that. So first is to experiment, play around, Google when stuck. I personally find it very useful to Google when I'm stuck, especially when I first took my first Python module, which was like um, CS 1010S. And I also read documentation. I start writing um, my your own code and also read other people's code. And you must be wondering why what's Python used for? There are many users to Python, the scientific computing, machine learning, I'll go interviews and more. And personally for me, I'm currently taking like a machine learning mod, which requires a, a quite extensive use of Python. So there are really many libraries and that's why Python is really, really useful. So um, basically the outline will be like to have a very self introduction of collab notebooks, arithmetic, basic data types, variables, um, flow control structures, function, um, built-in data structures, and yep, and the, probably the installation on local machine. So as for myself, I'll be going through from one to four. So Shuni will take over from the flow control structures on, onwards. So let's get started. So um, everyone, please go to the Collab Notebook link and we'll get started. So just a brief introduction to Collab Notebooks. So it's, it's, um, Google, it exists in Google Collaboratory and it's Collab for short. And it allows you to write and execute like Python, um, Python code in your browser. So it's a very easy sharing, zero configuration required and, and not important for the free access to GPUs. So let's go through um, basic arithmetic. So we can go through addition and subtraction first. I'm sure it's very easy for all of you. So like if I, I was just I just testing this code just now, but if you were to run it again, obviously you get one because one plus two minus seven plus five equals to one. And we can move on now to like multiplication and division. So the multiplication is performed with the star operator and like the division performed with the, the slash operator. Um, just to note one slash for normal division because we'll be going, we'll be having another one which is integer division, which I'll go through later. So yeah, just please take that into mind as well. So two times six, which obviously gives you 12. One divided by two, 0 0.5 in this case, because it's just division. And you must be wondering if I have three lines of code, like what's the output of this cell, right? So why is it 0 0.5? Because the reason is because Colab only prints the last value of, of the last line. Yeah. And you have crazy arithmetic. So remember that I told you that the normal division only has like one slash. So now if you really want integer, integer division, just the integer itself, right? Instead of using one slash, you use two slashes. So use double slash. It's basically division, but you only keep the whole number part. So. So that's why if you try, you get zero. And we try 12 um, double slash five, you get a two. And, and let's compare it to 12 divided by five using like one slash only. And you see the difference two versus like 2.4. So it really depends on what you wish to do. Yep. Um, so let's move on to like exponentiation. So, um, for exponentiation, we will use like the double star operator. So two double 
to um to power four is sixteen, and if you and if you realize these two outputs are exactly the same because it's two times two times two times two, so instead of using doing this, you can just easily use the exponentiation operator instead. So the, this one, um, the last one's a bit more, a bit, a bit new, I would say. So this is the modulo operation. So it returns you that the remainder of a division operation. And A modulo B will give you the remainder when you divide A by B. And, and you use the percentage operator. So if you do, if you do 51 mod 4, it's 3 because 3 is the remainder. Yeah, so here's our first challenge. So um, let's use Python to figure out how to calculate the number of hours from seconds. So I was timing an experiment, which lasted for four, six, seven, five seconds. And how many hours did I spend approximately? So I'll give you guys around maybe uh, two to three minutes to figure this out, and I'll go through the answers with you. So now it's around 10, 11. So I'll get back to you in 10, 14. Oh, and um, for those on, who are online in Zoom, you might want to like um, make a copy of the um, of the file of the collect file. Yeah, so you can make your own changes on it. Yeah. So just a remind so just a reminder that um you can save a copy of the Google Collab on your own. Okay, it's 1014, so let's review the answer. So if you want to find out how many hours that I spend approximately in the experiment, what I do is 475, and you want to find out hours. So generally, um, one, hour is, uh, one hour will be like 3,600 seconds. So in a sense, since you want to find out only the hours, you use integer division. So that's why the double slash, and as I, and I have said, B six zero zero. So if I run this, I should get one. And yeah, I did spend one hour approximately. So let's put all everything together, all the operators together. So if you run these two, um, two lines, you must be wondering why they're giving different outputs. This this is because the second one has a bracket, and brackets really make a difference. So yes, please remember that brackets make a difference. And obviously these are not all the operators and you can refer to this web, um, this link to check out more.
So let's move on to like the second exercise, which is the length of the hypotenuse. So if you recall the formula for finding the hypotenuse of a right angle triangle, so A equals to like um, square root of B square plus C square. And alternatively, the formula can be represented this way, um, as you can see here. So, um, so given the operators you just learned, not, not really modify, but um, I would like you guys to, code, to write the code to give us the hypotenuse of a right angle triangle with sides like B equals to three and C equals to four. So I'll give you another three minutes for that. So we'll, we'll uh, start again in like 10, 18, 10 um, 19. Okay, okay, it's 1019, so let's review the answer. So um, we have sites B goes to three and C goes to four. And what I like to do is I like, um, I prefer to see the formula in the alternate way, so it helps me. So what I do is I first do a bracket. And remember, we need B square and B goes to three. So it's three power power two, power two, plus B goes to four, right? And we need C squared, so 4, power, power 2, power 2, and, and lastly, we need the power to half, so that's why. And this will give you 5. So let's talk about variables now, and I'll be referring to the screen. So variables are names for you to associate certain values or references 
references. So for instance, I have A equals to five. So the equal, the equal operator is an assignment operator. So it reads whatever is on the right and assigns it to the variable name on the left. So obviously there'll be some variable name conventions. So number one, no spaces. Number two, only letters, numbers, and underscore characters. And you cannot be given a number. So Python's convention is to use snake keys. So replacing spaces with underscores. So example, snake underscore keys. So it's, as you can see, hacker um, underscore school. This is correct. However, the bottom three are all wrong for various reasons. So for, for in this case, there's a space in the name, so no spaces. So this violates the rule. The third one, there's an uppercase. The hit is the uppercase. And the last one is a camera case. And we use camera case in other languages and not Python. So um, like how I assign, so I assign A to A, I assign 13 to B. So C goes to A plus B. And what will what will be in C in the end? I know you guys will think that this is very easy, but I mean obviously it's 25. So but think of it this way. So pretend you have a cookie jar. So this cookie jar contains a value called eight. And another cookie jar contains a value called 13. So B is the cookie jar, if, if you want to put it that way. And C, um, and C equals A plus B equals to um, 21. Sorry, I made a mistake just now. So yeah, this is how you how you um, can visualize when you assign um, operators. So we refer back to the collab notebook. So that's what I did just now. I assigned I assign A to A, I assign 13 to B, and you see the output, and C equals to A plus B. So it's 20, so obviously it will be 21. And remember, collect notebooks only print the last value and variable they see in the code cell. So um, this is not the only way to declare A and B. So you can also do things like A comma B equals to 18, and 13. So 8 will be cores will correspond to A and 13 will correspond to B. And when you do the same thing, if you print A, you get 8, you print B, you get 13, and you print C, you get 21. But anyways, just a side note, this is just the print function. And you do, and you print um, 7, 5, and 1. So regarding this, I won't make I won't really make this a challenge, but I'll just do a, a demonstration. So um previously we did, we had a hypotenuse challenge, right? So we had sides like three and four. So let's say I assign x equals to three, and I assign y equals to four. And I use the same formula that I, I wrote for the hypotenuse challenge. And you still get the same answer. So and and assigning variables is actually a um, very good practice. So I encourage you guys to, to do that. And now we'll move on to basic data types. So there are a couple of basic data types like integers, float, um, float are basically numbers with decimal points, um, string, which is like text, and boolean, boolean means true or false. So you have several data types. So if you actually type, if you actually write this type a string, you get you give you a string, type five, you give an integer and a, a class called. And if you type 5.0, it's actually a float. So a floating point number, basically. So let's go back to the collab notebook. So as I say, if you, if you, if you wrote type six, you get integer. And also in Python, there's effectively no limit to how long an integer value can be. So if I print this, I'll still get a number anyways. And we'll move on to float. So type of this is actually a float. And if you compare this to this 4.2 versus 4, 
Do you see four is an integer, while four point two is a float? So remember the um, remember the difference. So also, if you, if you run these two cells, you also get a float a float number in in return. Okay, so let's move on to strings. So. Those strings are written in either double casing, um, double quotation marks, or single quote, or even uh, yeah, there are a few ways. So if you put type, if you run this, it's still a string, double quotation marks. If you use single quotation marks, it will also give you a string. And also, strings can be um, there can be multi-line strings. And that's why this will still give you back a string. So back to the slides, um, we'll, we'll go through string concatenation. So if you try to do this, Alice plus Bob, two strings, it give it Alice Bob because it's a string concatenation. So, um, so this plus sign is an addition operator when it operates on two integers or floating point values. But however, when this, um, this addition operator is used on two string values, it results in concatenation. But however, as you can see in this line, Alice plus 42, it'll give you an error because you can only concatenate things of the same type. So in this case, you, you can't concatenate a string and an integer. So let's go back to the collab notebook. So let's say I want to concatenate three strings. So A apple, B big root, C carrot. So if I want to concatenate, D goes to A plus B plus C. So I'll get apple, beetroot, and carrot. And there's spacing because I put spacings in between. So if I didn't put spacings in between, it will just become, it'll be become a mesh. So um, if you want to make things neater, I suggest you put spaces in between. And let's go to F strings. So with Python um, 3.6, so F strings are a great way to format strings with other variables. So let's say we had no F strings. So we like name Thomas, H equals to 21, print hello plus name plus you are. And this string, I need to use string dot string H because remember, if I, as I told you, you can't concatenate a string and a number. So to do that, you have to convert the number into a string using this function. So if you run this, you get hello Thomas, you're 21. But this is quite troublesome, right? So um, so let's see. So as strings, what you can do is you can, variables can be wrapped in braces for cl called cleaner syntax. So what you do is you put an F here, you put some braces um, containing the variable names and And you can see, do you see that this is way more convenient than having the concatenate multiple strings at once? So um, we can do the F string challenge. So um, I think what you guys can try to do is, since the format is already there for you, what you just need to do is, okay, let me just mo modify this a bit. Um, so what you need to do is you write your name, write your age, write your motivation for learning Python, and you try running this cell and see what, what you get. So since I think it's a bit faster, so I think I'll just give you guys two minutes, two minutes for this. So um, I think I see you guys again at like 10.31. So, um, so just to repeat, um, you just you guys need to just fill in the name, age, and motivation, these three variables, and just try running for yourselves and see what output you will get.
Okay, it's 10.31. So let me write. So as I inputted my own name, my own age, and my motivation, so you will get this output. And I hope you guys will see how, how useful F strings can be. So let's move on to Boolean values. So for Boolean values, there are two possible values, um, true or false. And in Python, you always start with a capital T or F. But just a disclaimer, this is just for Python. Yeah, when you need to start with a capital T or, or F. Yeah. And you have um, comparison operators as well. So equal equal means equal to. So this is not to be confused with the single equals operator because this, as I said uh, earlier, the single the single equals operator um, is an assignment operator. So please don't confuse with um, this one. And this one, not there's a not equal to, there's a less than, greater than, less than or equal to, and a greater than or equal to. So we have some comparison operators. So 140 more than 50, it's obviously true. That's why you give, give you back a true. 140 less than 50, it will give you a false. So if you see the string actually equals equals cool, it's not the same. It's literally not the same string. So that's why I give you a false. And that's why the last one, if HD equals equals HD, it will give back true. So, and also more about um, Boolean operators. So, and all and not operators are Boolean operators. So they operate on the Boolean values true and false. So the end operator is true. If both Boolean values are true, the all operator will give true if either Boolean values are true. And the not operator simply negates the corresponding Boolean value. I think this will be made clear when we go through the collab notebook. So, yep, let's go back to the collab notebook. So, firstly, if I assign a Boolean value to, to a variable, so I get true. And as I went through, um, actually equals equals cool. It will be false because they are not the same string. Um, actually not equals cool. It is true because it's really not cool. And actually equals equals actually will be true, obviously. And for this, 42 is more than 100. This is not true. That's why it will give you false. And I'll, I'll, run, I'll, run this, I'll run this style and I'll explain it later. So, True and true will give true. True and false. Remember, and you will only give true if both are, are true. So since there's a false inside, you will give a false. And, and same for the last line, false and true will give false because there's a presence of a false. So if I run this line, run this cell, true or true, both sides are true. So either one will do. So it'll give a true, true or false, because there's a true. And if you can remember, true if either Boolean values are true. So since there's a true here, it'll give back a true. And false or false, we'll, only, we'll just give a false because there's no true inside that print statement. Okay, so let's go through this cell. The number equals to 20. So number mod 3 equals equals 0. This, this is false. And this is true. Because 20 is a, um, um, so 5 is a multiple of 20, but 3 is not a multiple of 20. So because this is false, this thing is false, this thing is true, 
So false and true. False and true will still give you back false. And as for this, this is true because three is a multiple of 15. This is not true because two is not a multiple of 15. So you have true and false. So true and false will still give you false. So the unary operators, um, not true. So it negates, right? So not true will give you false. And not not true. Let's run this first and I'll explain. Not not true will give you true because not true is false, right? And not false will give you back true. So if you have a double negation, you give you back true in this case. So, um, Right now, we will have a five minutes break before I pass on the time to Chun Yi, who will go through um, the rest of flow control, the loops and uh, yeah, while well, loops for loops functions. Yep, so we have a five minute break now. So um, we will start in like um, 10.42.
Oh, it's checking. Uh, can everyone zoom hear me? All right. Uh, cool. Okay, we'll be starting. Yeah, so those people who are not here, like call your friends, like to come back quickly. Yeah, okay, so I'll continue. Yeah, I'll continue from where we left off. So basically, so far you've seen all your Python code, right? It kind of runs in a, a top down, left to right kind of format. And this is good in the sense that it's very intuitive for us to read because it's kind of like reading a book, right? Because when you read a book, you read top down, left to right. But also this is um this severely limits kind of what we can do with our Python code. And so you notice like, let's say if I want to do something like uh, copy and paste, like if I want to do something like repeat a block of code uh, X number of times, like a hundred times, a thousand times, I will have to kind of copy and paste the code a hundred times or a thousand times. And this is not very efficient, right? And, and so flow control is that we don't want our code to just run top down, left to right. We want to do stuff like um, executing blocks of code when a condition is met or when we want to like execute certain blocks of code repeatedly. So these are the two kinds of flow control that I will go through now. Yeah, so the first type is kind of like an if-else statement, right? And so there are two parts to this if-else statements. Basically, the first step is kind of like checking through the condition. And basically, a condition is something that will always evaluate to either true or false, kind of like the Boolean values that actually kind of brought up in the first half. Right, so if you look at this block of code over here, basically what this block of code is trying to show you is basically it's checking a condition saying if name equal equal Alice. And you know, if you remember equal equal, not to be confused with the assignment operator equal, it will always return a condition. Basically it's checking if my name is equal to Alice. So this will either return true or false, right? And so basically what the if else statement kind of says is basically if name is Alice or this thing will return true, and if it's true, I'll run the code indented in this um, if, if block, right? And so Python kind of recognizes uh, these kind of code blocks right, by this indentation over here. So in Python, there'll be like a four space indentation or single tab, basically. And that's how you tell Python, hey, only run this if a condition is met, right? And so what happens if this is uh, false is that it kind of skips this line of code, indented code, and it goes straight to the else statement, if you have an else statement. So if the name is not equal to Alice, this will return to false. This will evaluate it to false, and then you'll go to the print statement that says, hello stranger, right? And so uh, what if we want to do multiple checks? So that is where we kind of have a else if statement, right? And in, and in Python, uh, the else if is kind of shortened to uh, elif, E-L-I-F. And so now you can see uh, our code kind of have like multiple uh, condition checks, right? So the first check, it kind of checks if, so how this kind of code kind of runs, basically it checks if name is equals to Alice, I'll run the first indented block of code, right? But if it isn't, I'll move on to the next check, okay? And then I'll check if name is equal to Bob or print hi Bob. And then finally, if that check also returns a false, then I'll sort of go to the final else statement, okay? So um, can anyone tell me if my name is equal to Alice and I print this, will I still continue to go through these blocks of code? Can you like, take a guess here, anyone? Yeah, I see a few uh, head shakes, right? Yeah, so basically, once uh, I've made a condition, I've made a condition, I'll kind of execute the block of code over here and I'll skip past the other else if or else statements, right? And so let's go to our Colab notebook and kind of see a bigger chunk of code. Okay, yes. Can anybody kind of like look at this um, chunk of code and kind of maybe take a guess how this will run? So uh, for people who are like new to programming, this might be a bit daunting because it's a very big block of code. So I've, normally I think what helps is kind of like looking at this code and thinking line by line how the computer interprets it. So if you look through the first two lines, kind of it's more of like assignment operators. So we will assign name to Carol and age to 3000, right? And then we get to this very big uh, if else block. So basically what this code is saying, basically we check if name is Alice, right? And our name is not Alice, so it will not, it will skip this block of code. And then you head over to the next if else block, uh, the, the next else Alice block, right? And you'll check if our age is less than 12. And this will kind of return false as well. 
And then finally, we'll, and then next, we'll go kind of the next elif and we'll check if h is 2000, right? And this kind of returns true because 3000 is bigger than 2000. Then you'll print this and then you'll skip the rest of the elif block, right? So if you kind of run this code, you'll see that this kind of what Python returns, right? So any questions on how like if else blocks kind of work? Zoom chat, anyone? Any question? Yeah. Mm, yes, so we can kind of try it out, right? Since we have the ability to kind of change the code here. Yeah, so we check this. Now the H bigger than 100 kind of the check is above it, right? And we run it. Yeah, you see the print statement is different, right? So you also, when you do if else statements, you need to be very careful of like what kind of order you're going to put your checks, right? So the more important check order, the check you kind of want to run first, kind of put in front, and then it kind of matters the order, right? And so the second kind of flow control statement I want to introduce to everyone is the kind of wow loops, right? Or like just loops in general. So this um, kind of flow control kind of allows you to repeatedly execute certain lines of code given a certain condition, right? So it's more of like a three-step process, basically. What the Python code is doing, it kind of checks whether the condition given in a while loop is true. Even if it's true, then it runs the indented code block. And then it will repeat the step one again, which is checking if the condition is true. And if the condition is true, it keeps repeating, repeating the code in the code block. Otherwise, when the condition finally returns kind of false, then you kind of go out of the code block. So you can see this code block here. Basically, we initialize the variable count of zero. And then after that, we kind of say our well, count is less than five. We print hello world. And then we kind of keep adding to count, right? Until it hits more than five. In this case, it will kind of print count five times and then you exit out of the loop. So anyone confused about this right, flow control so far? Any questions? I think there's one in chat. All right, cool. Yeah, so the other cool things you can do with while loops. So, so far we know that kind of breaks out if the condition in the condition here, if it's false, it kind of breaks out of the loop, right? But there are other ways to kind of break out of the while loop. So there's this keyword called break where you can kind of put in a while loop. So this is kind of a very special um, while loop, right? Where you can put while true. Can you have, can anyone kind of like guess what this does? Anyone? Zoom chat? Yeah, so it basically kind of, oh, example, oh, sorry, UA, right? Uh, what kind of, where were you confused by? Like what, which part were you confused by? Oh, previous one? Okay. So I'll just go through maybe like loop again, right? So the while loop is kind of a three-step process. So basically, if you look at this line of code, right? Basically, first step, it kind of checks this uh, while loop, right? Is this, and this regime return a Boolean value as well. So it's kind of like your if else statement, right? And it checks basically is count less than five. And so basically we started with count zero. And so this is zero less than five and you'll print hello world. And then you add one to count. So count is now one. And then you'll loop again and you'll check this condition a second time. So count one less than five, you'll print hello world, add one, two less than five, then you'll print hello world and you keep going until a count is equal to five, then five is no longer less than five. And this will be false, right? And so it'll kind of get out of this indented code block and print done. Uh, yeah, no problem. So now we move to a while loops with break, right? So while true is kind of a special uh, while statement where it kind of loops forever, right? So if you don't have anything to like, stop it, it's basically an infinite loop, right? And so what this code is saying, I just will run through this code to make you like, allow you to understand. Basically, uh, if count equals to five, this is uh, this will evaluate to false. If you know, remember your if else statement. And so nothing in this code block will run, and you'll skip to the next code, the uh, next line of code. And I'll print hello world, right? And it will add one to count. So now count is now one, right? And then you go through this loop again. Count is now equal to five, so you print hello world, go again, and then 
you'll print hello world um, five times and then you'll go to this code block, right? And if count equal to five. Now, when our count is equal to five, this will return true and we'll go to this keyword called break. And it's actually what break tells the Python code to do is basically break out of whatever loop is currently in. And so it will break out of this while loop and then it will print done. So this is essentially another way of writing this code, right? With a break statement. So any questions on how break statements work? Yeah, okay. So moving on, there's one more um, keyword you can use in while loops or loops in general. And that's the continue action. And what continue tells is tells um, Python to do is kind of basically ignore everything after the continue and re, uh, re rerun the loop again, basically. So if you look at this um, while loop, which is kind of a continuation of the previous code, basically you start with an infinite loop while true. And then you kind of start going, right? And if count less than zero, so currently count is zero. And then it kind of goes into this code block and says continue. And continue just tells it to ignore everything else in the code block and restart the loop again, right? Yes. And so we kind of, let me have this thing here, but basically we need this. So we'll add count, we'll add one to count and then we'll continue, right? And then it kind of, basically it'll continue and then it'll go to, or true again. And then if count less than zero, now count is one. You go into this code block, add one to count again, and then you'll continue, you'll skip this again. And then after that, count is more than two now, and count is equal to two, so this will return false, and you'll skip this entire if else chunk, uh, this if block, right? And now you'll print, oh. and now you'll print I'm bigger than two, and then you'll keep going, and basically this row, because we do not have a break statement here, this will basically run infinitely. Yeah, so it, um, if you do have like a while true, do have a break statement. Uh, okay, so now if you look at our collab statement, this is kind of a mix of all the while breaks and continues, right? Can anyone kind of sort of guess what this like line of code will do? Oh, before that, any questions on like um, break and continue statements? Zoom chat, everyone okay? Yes, so if you don't have any breaks, then when you're about through, you kind of loop forever. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, that's kind of true. Yes. So basically, what this code kind of does, I'll just run you through line by line, right? So you see, it starts with while true. And so kind of this is kind of an infinite loop, right? And so it starts off with saying kind of like print who are you? So we run this code. It says who are you, right? And so if you type like type my name here, it say it ignores us because what, what basically this does, it kind of goes through this if check and my name is not Joe, so it doesn't break out the while loop. And kind of goes through the while loop again, right? So let's say if I type Joe, right? So you see, you see this line, this is kind of where Python is in like the interpretation process. And so it kind of breaks out this while loop. And then it kind of goes, uh, hello Joe, what is your password, right? And then uh, you can see kind of, we check if the password is swordfish. So I kind of know the password by looking at the code. So if I type uh, anything else, it kind of restarts the whole while loop, right? And we go show, and then we go swordfish. And see, it kind of says access granted and it breaks out the loop because when the password is equal to swordfish, we break out the loop. So any questions on how this code kind of works? Yeah, you can. So let's say you want to change it to say access denied, right? Let's say you don't want it to loop again, right? Let's say, for example, you want to modify this code to kind of break out the loop once like your, your name is wrong, right? Kind of. So let's say if my name is not Joe, let's um say print access denied and then we kind of so if you want to break our loop what's the keyword to use break yeah 
So instead of continue, we cannot use break here, right? And so now if you can, see, if you kind of like run the code and we set type any other name. Oh, yes. So there's a print statement here that prints outside. So basically it breaks out of the loop. And because this print statement is outside of the loop, it kind of prints access granted as well. So you kind of need to change it a bit more. All right. So any questions on how this code kind of functions? Oh, I think someone in chat. All right. Yeah. Wait. So basically, you just revert the code. Yeah. So if you notice, um, if the password is not so official, so let's try that. Okay. Let me just type random gibberish. And you see, it kind of loops again, right? And why does it loop again? You notice the indented code. You see all this aside from the print access granted statement. Everything else is indented this while true loop, right? And so if the password is not uh, swordfish, it doesn't break. So what happens when the code doesn't break? It kind of restarts the while true loop and it starts from the top. And that's kind of why uh, when your password is wrong, it will go again and start from who are you, right? So is that what you're asking, uh, Kyrie? Or instead of starting from the asking name, uh, what you can do if you want to kind of do that, you can do a double while loop, but we wouldn't cover that now. Yes, so you can have like a while loop here, and then you have an hour while loop specifically for the password, and then you kind of loop through that. Yeah, any other questions? Yeah, cool. Okay. So uh, there's also another kind of loop you can kind of use, which is a for loop. And basically for loop kind of terminates, not by a condition, but basically for for loop, you kind of have a variable, like something like this. It kind of says for i in range something, right, in Python. And basically what this code is saying, instead of like checking a condition, I check a range of values. Basically I assign i to the values one to five, basically. So I run through this for loop five times basically. So it's saying like for i in each of these value one to one to five, basically, I loop through this print. So this print will loop through, sorry, not one to five, zero to four. So Python is like a zero, everything in Python kind of like, if you have a list and everything, it starts with zero instead of one. And this is a common thing in a lot of uh, programming languages, right? So it starts for i for i in range five. So basically, if I do something like a, uh, print i, this will kind of do like, so it'll print zero, then it'll print hello world, you'll go through the loop again, you'll print one, hello world, two, three, four, and then you'll break out the loop and print done. So that's kind of what a for loop does. So instead of checking a condition, it kind of runs through this uh, range of values, right? Hey, this is, let me just stop this. And so these are some ways you can kind of play around with the range function, right? So for this one, you do like range in five, print i, see it prints zero, one to four, like kind of what we went through, right? And another thing about range function, you can kind of declare a start and stop function, like a start and stop. And basically what you need to know about this like a range value, if you see in here, basically uh, it's inclusive of the start value, but it's exclusive of the end value. Uh, that's just kind of how Python works. So it will include 12, but it will stop just before 16. So 12, 13, 14, 15. So you do like 16 minus 4, it should print 4 times, right? So this is kind of what it does. Prints 4 times. And you can also do something like indicate the number, like the step. And the step is basically uh, what you add to, the to get the next value, right? And so you do like range 20, 10, minus 1. What this does is kind of count 20 down to 11 backwards, right? And so uh, maybe I have a quick exercise. If I change this to, let's say, uh, 10, 22, can anyone kind of like tell me what this returns? Yeah, that's right. So 
Yeah, so it runs 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. So if I modify a step here, it can kind of increase or decrease based on the number, the step I indicated. Any questions on how for loop work or loops in general? All right, so now you'll go to this um, flow control challenge, right? Uh, basically, I'll give you about eight minutes to solve this. Try and think. So basically, this is kind of where you need to use a combination of your flow control statements, a combination of your loops and your if else statements, and try to kind of solve this line by line and kind of try and do this. Yeah. So I'll give you about eight minutes to come back at 11 11. Uh, any why are all the numbers even? Ah, uh, okay, yes. No problem, no problem. Yes, so basically, the step here kind of tells it, basically, for the next number, what do I add to the current number? And so basically, it starts with 10, right? And I print 10. And then it says the step is 2. So basically, I want to increase the value by 2. Then it goes to 12, 14, 16, 18. And then finally, when it hits 20, it says stop the loop. Yeah, so you can do stuff like, Let's say I don't want uh, two, I want three. Now this now, uh, each number is an increment of three until 20. Right. So now uh, everyone just kind of take eight minutes. We'll come back at 11, 12 and kind of just try and complete this challenge.
Okay, it's a uh, eleven show. So I'll try and go through this slowly. Anyone need more time or anything? Okay, yes. So maybe let's go through by, um, this question like line by line. Uh, so basically, the first part kind of says we want to do like for all the integers from one to hundred. So basically, we kind of go through by writing like start with a for loop, right? Can anyone tell me uh, what the range for the for loop is? Uh, Zoom or anyone here? One to sorry. One to one, one to hundred. Hundred and one. Can anyone tell like why is it hundred and one? Yeah, that's correct. All right. So basically, we need to do hundred and one because it's inclusive of the start value, but it's exclusive of the end value, right? Can anyone tell me why I can't just do uh hundred and one like that? Yeah, that's right, because you start from zero, right? So the correct way, let's see, zoom check. Yep, yep, everyone zoom check got here, so. Yes, so basically, we kind of start from one to 101, okay? And then we start with, uh, basically, you notice all this is kind of like if-else statements, right? So basically, what we want to do is kind of do if-else statements. So we start with the first one. And so how we check if something is divisible, then you kind of use the modulo operator that actually introduced at the start. We do if i is modulo of 15, i modulo of 15 is equal to zero basically. And this kind of does, there's no remainder left. So it's definitely divisible by zero. Here we do print this, right? And so we kind of do this for the next few statements as well, right? So if i equals to and oh, we need to else if else if I want to zero we print bus and then can anyone tell me like what the last statement should be? Yeah, okay, cool. So else to print, that's right. So let's try run this. Yes, yeah. Yeah, so that's kind of what it does, right? Number three, free fizz, buzz, fizz, buzz. Okay, so I want to kind of modify the code. So can anyone tell me what happens if I move this, this print if statement, I move it down to the third statement. Let's say I do something like, Can, tell me if, can anyone tell me if this will work? Yes, and why is that? Yeah, so basically the order matters in this case because kind of anything that's divisible by 15 so is divisible by 5 and 3, right? So you enter the first two if else statements first before it ever gets to this else if else statement. So in this case, you kind of need to think about what order you should order your if else statements, right? In this case, it's kind of the order the question kind of gave you. And this is kind of a quite famous programming problem. It's called a FizzBars test. It kind of tests you on like your flow control, your the idea of flow control in general, right? Yeah, so moving on. So this all we cover for flow control. Any questions about if else statement for loop? Yes, okay. Uh so basically, sorry, yeah. Yes, so basically what the modulo operator kind of does, it kind of basically it just says like, what's the remainder if I divide i by five, right? So in case, mm, so basically you remember if else statements, we kind of, for the condition, we kind of need it to be a true or false kind of thing, right? So basically we want to check if there's no remainder, then it's definitely visible by zero, uh, divided by something like five, right? And that's kind of why we have a zero, equal, equal, zero, and can you use i equals equal to integer? Uh, uh. But if you use equal equal in, like you want to check the type of the value, is it? Sorry, can you clarify the 
Si vous voulez. Ah, ok. Je vais give it a try, actually. Yeah, so if you ever have a, you want to try something like that. So if you want to check if the type of something is an integer, you know, do, I think it's type of, not type. Okay, let's try string type type. It doesn't print. Uh, yes, sorry, my bad. Let's do integer. That's not equal to. So we cannot say that's not equal to integer. Oh, no. Wait, if I type out. Divisible by. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Uh, let me get back on your But yeah, you can kind of try and see if that works. Yeah. But I think the easier way is still kind of to use the modular in like modulo operator. Yeah, uh, so you see i equals five still returns kind of a float for everything. So probably not working somewhere, but yeah, in a short time we'll go on. But yeah, but I mean, yes. Uh, so the question was that, can we, instead of using modulo, can we just check if the resultant value is a float or an integer, right? And of course, if it's a fraction, it will kind of go into a float. And then can we just check if it's a float? Then if it's a float, we kind of know it's not divisible. Yep. But doesn't seem it works. Seem like it works. You can try and see. But don't think it's working. Yeah. So you see for five is still ignoring it. No, yes. On the last and it isn't. Hmm. Yeah, so if anyone can or can get this work, but yeah, I think the easiest way is still kind of to use a modular operator here. Yeah, in the interest of time, I kind of move on from flow control. Anyone got any other questions for like if else statements or for loops, while loops? Yeah, okay. So we move on to the next part, which is kind of like functions. And so what functions are basically in, wait, let me just close this in chat. Yeah, it's a group of statements that perform a specific task, right? And what you can think of function is kind of like a reusable block of code. And so it kind of helps to break your program into smaller and like reusable chunks and makes it a lot more organizable. And so basically for functions, there are like a few keywords in the key in mind when you want to make a function in Python. So basically, first thing is the DEF keyword, right? And this is basically defined. So this tells Python you want to make a new function. And then basically the usual syntax is kind of the name of a function, which is kind of anything as long as you don't use like special characters. And then you use brackets, and then you kind of have the num the, the name of the parameter you want to you want it to enter. Right. Yes, the slides will be shared uh, at the end of the session. Yep. And then it kind of prints. Uh, and then it kind of like does something. And you notice also once again it's indented. So this kind of tells Python this is part of the function. And anything outside of the function doesn't outside of this indented block, it kind of doesn't show. It doesn't uh, evaluate that it doesn't recognize as a part of the function. And these are the like, statements. Basically. And so if you call this function basically hello, hello with a bracket, and you kind of enter our name here, it kind of returns hello to So basically, this is telling the Python interpreter that for um, this function call, our name here is going to be Tom. 
right? So basically, uh, a lot of people ask like this kind of over, sometimes uh, over complicated stuff, right? So why do we use functions, right? So let's say you're at work, right? And your boss tells you, uh, can, can you, I need you to like greet everyone uh, that comes by. And you're a bit lazy, right? So you kind of create a, fun a Python function to kind of, kind of do it for you. So you're just like, every time someone walks by, you kind of like print hello, print Tom, hello Tom, hello Jane, hello world, right? And then one day your boss walks up to you and says, uh, hi, I don't think, uh, you know, hello is a very um, good way, a formal way of greeting them. I want you to greet them and say like, good morning instead. And if you have like a function like this, right? Or like you have a script like this, right? You kind of need to change all the print statements one by one. Good morning, Jane. Good morning, Tom. Good morning, Will. And that's kind of troublesome, right? And so if you're using uh, um, functions where your code is kind of reusable, all you have to do is kind of like, for example, you have a function that says hello name. If I want to change, like if my boss doesn't need, I think hello is too informal, I need to change it to good morning. I just need to change the function itself, right? And then so like every time I call this function, everything will change to good morning, right? So that's kind of the use of functions, right? Is to make code reusable and so make it very easy to modify. Because if you modify the function itself, it kind of modifies all the function calls afterwards. So uh, a function also have like multiple parts inside the code block. Usually you have a return keyword where it tells you um, what the function should return. So basically, if you look at the next function, basically, first of all, I'll just run through this code with you. Basically, you start with a definition, define, this is the function name, and this is the variable name you want to put in a function, right? And then we go into an if else statement, right? And basically, we check for the guest number, and the guest number is one, we return a value. And return is not a print statement, I just need to clarify. Return is something completely different. I'll kind of go through in examples how this return statement works. But I just need to know that currently, basically, I put something in a function and I get something back. And what I get back is that return statement, right? And so this is kind of checking the guest number and then I return a certain value, right? So if we hop back to our CoLab notebook. Yeah, so you look at this, something like that. If we return, so basically this is a very simple function that basically just returns a value for you too. It doesn't matter. And you notice the bracket empty. And usually you leave the bracket empty, you don't want it to have any input, right? And so we just start by defin defining it. Right. Then now let's say you want to just call the function. And how to call a function is you kind of call it without the definition keyword, the DEF keyword, right? And just put, basically the, the, the bracket kind of match this. In terms of like, if there's a variable inside, you kind of need to input a variable for it to run. But if you notice, now it kind of just returns for you too, right? So let's say if I don't have a return keyword, right? You notice this returns nothing, right? So basically, what the return keyword kind of tells you is basically every time I call the function, what does the function like finally when it ends, what does it give back, right? So we kind of need the return keyword here. Right. And so this is a bit more different function where it actually does something. So we call it add two, and you think of that variable called x, and then you just kind of add two to that variable. Right. So can anyone just kind of guess the output of this? Ooh, wait, someone said, someone said four? Yeah, so... Yeah, basically, it just kind of adds four to it. Now, can anyone guess the fun the value of this? Five. Okay. Yeah. So we add. So basically, this basically does evaluates the the one inside. So add two to one. This will evaluate to three, and then you evaluate the whole thing. So add two to three, you'll go to five, right? How about this one? Yep. Yeah. So forty-four. Yes, that's because we defined it wrongly here. Yeah, so 44. All right, so the other functions and throughout the course, you actually be using a function itself, using print, which is also a function. So now we do something a bit more uh, complex. 
So basically, this is kind of like a function where you can kind of try and calculate your cap using a bunch of variable, right? So basically, if in a function you want to declare more than one variable, you cannot separate them with commas. So in this case, this is a function with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 3, 6, 9, so 11 variables, you see? And I kind of separate all this. So basically, this is kind of a function to kind of calculate your cap or your GPA. So like A plus, A, A minus, B plus, so and so forth, right? And so basically, how this works, you kind of take the total module, number of modules taken. So basically, you enter the number of modules that got A plus, number of modules that got A, so and so forth. And kind of add the total number of values you have, you have. And then for your sum of grade points, you kind of take that and times the grade value for each grade. Right. So for A plus, you get a 5.0. For A, you get, you get yeah, 5.0. For A, you get a 5. A minus, you get a 4.5. So on and so forth. Right. Does anyone, is anyone like confused by this um, function declaration? Or anyone ever like kind of understand how, how it works? Right, okay, so I'll just show you some examples. So we start by initializing it. Okay, so let's say we have a student who has like 2A plus, 2A, and 1A minus, right? And see, so it kind of calculates the cap for us. Right? And then let's say we use a different value. We get 4.0, right? Okay, so can you tell me what happens if I do all zeros? Anyone kind of guess? What happens if I declare all my variables in zero? So you would think it would be zero, right? So if you run it, notice there's an error. And so if you look at your code, you notice that what this returns, it returns the sum of grade points over total modules taken, right? However, your total module taken, right? If you add everything out, it's zero. And so when you can when you try and divide try and divide a value by zero in Python, you'll get something called a zero division error. So yeah, so you need to check your values. So um, basically you notice that this is kind of a bit tedious, right? If you want to like declare like 2a, 2a plus 2a, and then the rest all zeros, you need to like type out and count the number of zeros you add. Right. And basically, if you add more than what you declare, something like that, you add too many zeros. It kind of say, hey, that's not what you declare because you need to declare 11 variables and you have 12 variables here, right? So it's kind of troublesome to kind of, especially you have like longer functions with a lot of variables. It's a bit troublesome. So what we can do is we have like default value where we declare the functions. So you notice here we have, instead of just writing the variable name, we have like assignment operator. And this is kind of just tells us like, if I don't input a, var I don't in input a value, what do I set the default value as? And they say we set it all to zero, right? And now when we declare a function, we kind of declare only the ones we want, right? So basically, let's say I want to do like a, let's change this a bit, right? So if I want to do like A plus, I got three A pluses, and I got maybe uh, two B pluses, right? And so you kind of initialize the rest that we didn't declare or any update this. And then we call this, yes. And so it kind of initializes all the other values as zero. And this makes uh, our life a lot easier when you are using the function, right? So you only can you need to declare the ones we have and the rest in kind of the Python interpreter kind of just assumes we got zero for the rest of it. Uh, any questions so far on how like functions work? Mm, those in person, any questions? All right, so uh, we'll move on to something that's a bit harder to guess. Oh, wait, we have a question. Curious is return function. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, I think it's a lot more complex than that, but yeah. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of like that. So basically, it's kind of like a very complex function and just can't return you the results. Yeah. So okay, moving on. Uh, so something a bit more complex is kind of like the scope and lifetime of variables, right? So basically, this is something you need to keep in mind when you're declaring functions. 
and a lot of people when they see so for example this like example code right you notice in the function itself we declare like x equals to 10 y equals to 2 and we print the value of x in a function basically you need to understand that functions have something called a scope right and basically everything declared within a function kind of gets destroyed at the end of the function call so it, it's not like a universal global variable right and so if you notice this code where we start with x equal to 20 we call my function and then we print the x value outside the function so a lot of people when they look at this code they kind of see hey inside the function you kind of call x equals to 10 right so when i print this value kind of x should be equal to 10 10 but that's not the case right if you notice value inside the function is 10 value outside the function is 20 and you notice so basically the x inside the function is not equal, it's not the same as the x outside the function. All the variables um, inside the function are kind of in a different scope, right? And this might be a bit hard to understand, but I just need to know this exists for now. You kind of get used to it over time. All right? And you notice uh, if I try to print yy, it says it's not defined because it's only like kind of defined inside the function itself. So if I do something like uh, print why, why? Notice it prints when it's inside the, the function, but once it escapes the function, why, why does not exist outside the function? So this is kind of like the scope of the function itself. Yeah, and so now we move over to the, back to the hypotenuse curve, um, function. And so I'll give you all, let's say five minutes and try to rewrite um, the hypotenuse function as a function, basically. This should be quite simple. If you have any questions, uh, those in Zoom can just feel free to type in chat. And anyone here can just raise their hand. So we'll come back at 11.39.
Okay. Uh, it's 11.39. So I'll just kind of maybe go through with you how this works. So basically, um, we're going to do it a very standard way of declaring a function. Kind of define. There you go. Uh, hypotenuse. Okay, so can you tell me uh, what, what are the variables and how many variables do I need to get? B and C? Yeah, cool. Yep, that's right. And so how do we find hypotenuse? Any, anyone still remember? Yes, so the power operator is sort of, you can do B and then we do power two, so it's this double star two plus B power two times square root, right? So the square root here we will do zero point five. And so if you try it out, notice the happens returns the correct value, right? Three square, four square, and the square root that that's twenty five square root five. So yeah, that's kind of how it should work. Yeah. Any questions or functions? All right. So I think we have some time. So I'll return to the previous, like some of the questions we had just now. So maybe this one, right? Why can't we use a uh, type I will five, right? So let me just, let me just create a new code block. Yeah. So if you try something like five divided by five and you run the code here, right? You notice no matter whether it's a whole number or not, it always returns float right so checking for an integer doesn't really work out so like even if i do like 10 divided by 5 it says it's 2.0 and we check the type see so you always return a flow when you're doing a division in python so that's kind of why you have to use i mean you could try find other methods but this is kind of why uh checking for type doesn't really work right and I think there was a question on uh, kind of what we want to do if we want to, instead of breaking out this loop, right? Instead of restarting from like, who are you? We want to restart from what's your password. So kind of how we can do this, we can do a double while loop. So instead of continue here, we break, right? And then kind of start a second while loop here. And let's try running this. So if I go, wait, maybe that's not good to do. Continue. And otherwise, we kind of go else, break out the top all loop, bring this print statement over here. So we try and run this. Or must it be returned? Can it be returned? Okay, we'll get back to that later. Okay, so basically, Joe, and let's say if I type a wrong password, see it goes back to password. So kind of you can kind of do this with 12 loops. And if I type swordfish. It breaks out and prints X and that. That's kind of how you can do it if you don't want it to look back, right? And so for your question, can it? Can we do just print and without return, right? So let's try that, right? So instead of return, we do a print. You notice it prints, right? But the problem with this is that it doesn't return anything. Let's say if I wanted to do hypotenuse 3 plus 4 plus 1. So you would think this would return 6, right? But you notice it returns a type error. And this is because if we check, we print hypotenuse 3, 4. Yes, 
Let me just comment this one. Notice it's print, it prints none, right? That's because we didn't specify a return statement. And by default, if you don't have a, a return statement, it kind of returns the value of none. And so if you do like try to do math with it, we do it will kind of return none plus one, which is kind of an error. So if you want to do like anything outside of displaying it, you kind of need to just return it. Right. And so now if you define a return, notice the function, the return, the, the value of this itself is not none, it is actually uh 5.0, and now we can do math with it, right? But I just clear this. Yeah, so that's kind of the difference between return and print. All right, so next part. So basically, Python has some very, uh, they have some built-in data structures that can kind of help you with your uh, kind of code, basically. So the ones we want to introduce to you today are lists, which are basically, you can think of them as what it says, like a, a, like a list of objects, a collection of objects you can. And so basically lists are basically declared by using these square brackets here. And basically you can put anything in this square bracket. So you think of it like a basket of all your items, right? So for example, you see here, uh, cat, bat, red, elephant. And you kind of, so you separate each item with a comma. And basically you can put anything from all the types we taught you earlier, right? So you can put strings, you can put numbers, you can put a different variety of them and you can put a list inside itself, basically. And so how, once you have this list, right, you need you might also need to know like how do I retrieve these items, right? And so basically you need to first like, assign it to a variable, like list one, list two, list three. And basically how this works is that sort of like your follow, everything starts with zero and it's indexed from there. So basically it's ordered by how you first declare it. So basically in like this spam list, basically the first the zero element is cat. And then it goes to one is bad, two is red, and then three is elephant, and then four is out of range, right? So that's kind of how this kind of work and how you can call the items in your basket of items easily. And you can call them backwards, basically. So how negative numbers call index and index. Basically, negative one just means the last element. And negative two is kind of second last element, negative three, third last element. Right. So that's how we can like let's say you want to like call stuff in reverse reverse order. You can kind of use this negative indices to call it. Yeah, and that's kind of how lists are kind of indexed. And basically, there are other very, very cool things you can do with lists once you like kind of get the hang of it. And do something like list slicing. So let's say I want like I don't want the individual elements, right? I want part of the list. So you can do something like slicing the list and kind of just and think of it as like cutting the basket in half and kind of taking the remaining values, right? So let's see. And you can kind of do that with wait, any questions so far? Oh yeah. So we can kind of like do that with like this colon operator, right? And basically what this tells us is basically I want to get the values from zero to four and make that uh, a separate sum list kind of. But I think it's here because you have only four elements, zero to four is basically the whole list. But you do something like one to three. It'll take, basically this is sort of like your for loop where it's inclusive and then exclusive of three. So it'll take everything from in between. So you'll start from one, two, and then you'll stop at three. So you'll get bad and red if you do this. Any questions on how lists work and how list slicing kind of works? Yeah, okay. And another cool thing you can do, you can find basically the size of your list by checking the length. So you can tell us like how big your list is. So just check using this function called length that's built into Python. It'll tell you, hey, you have three items in your basket. Other cool things you can do with this, concatenation, replication. So if you add two lists together, it kind of merges it into one giant list. You can multiply the list and it kind of basically give you repeated values. Right. Uh, the PowerPoint will be given to you at the end of the session. Yep. Yeah. So these are kind of like how you can kind of use 
list. And then there are other things, for example, you want to add items after you declare the list, right? How do you do that? So basically, append is a function that's built in. And it's a very special function in the sense that you don't call it like a normal function, right? So how do you call it, like this kind of functions? You kind of do, you have a fun, you have a list, and then you kind of call dot append so that it kind of knows what to, which list to operate on, right? And so it goes dot append, and then you kind of call, uh, you add like a value here, and it adds to this list basically. You can also do insert where you can kind of specify a index on where you want to insert. And basically what this does, it kind of uh, adds it in the in between that index and then anything else, you'll move back one, one index. So if I insert XX here, notice that my second, my second value, so zero, one, two, my second value is XX. And then now my third value is Mori, yeah. And then you can also remove items by specifying um, and what value you want to remove, right? So this kind of removes the first matching value of the list. So you have a list of 0, 2, 3, 2. I remove 2. Basically, it will search through the list starting from the start. And you'll find the first value of 2 and it kind of removes it. You'll kind of see how this works in later examples. You can use pop. And what pop does is basically remove the last item of the list. Or if you pop, you can also indicate a number and they'll in remove like the index of the, the, the item at the index basically. So if I pop one, you remove item at index one, right? So you look at this list, it's kind of like zero, one, two. So you notice, uh, you'll remove this and then you get four, five. Right, so I kind of breeze past this. So any questions on how this work, how to add items, append items, remove items, anything? What's the difference with a pen? Okay. So for a pen, so a pen and pop are very special. In terms of a pen only adds to the, go back here. A pen only adds to the end of the list. So it's very useful if you just want to add something to the end of the list. And basically a pen is basically just insert last item to the list. Whereas insert, you cannot have to declare like um, which index you're going to add in, right? So let's say if you want to continuously uh, insert items to the end of the list. You kind of need to, using only insert, you kind of need to keep track of like what's the length of the list. So you need to like check the length of the list and then put it at the end, right? Whereas you can just kind of call it a pen and then you automatically add it to the end of the list. And also it's kind of similar with like remove and pop, right? They both do the same thing in the sense that they remove an item from the list. But for remove, you can kind of choose what index you want. Where, um, oh, sorry, for remove, you can choose what item you want to remove. But for pop, you kind of choose what index you want, or by default, you just kind of remove the last item from the list. So depending on your context and like what you know about what you want to remove, you kind of, kind of choose whether you want to use pop or you want to use uh, remove. Okay, so for lists, because they are a built-in data structure, Python has actually a lot of really um, special syntax and like special stuff you can do with it. You can check if an item is in a list and you return. So basically, this is kind of like a condition. It will return a Boolean, whether it's true or false. So you can check, basically, you search if something is a list, you return true, and if it's not, you can you return false. You can loop through lists in a very special way. You can just kind of do, for example, if I have a, this called supply. I can look through a list. I can call this anything I want. And basically, this index, instead of a range, you notice I, I give them a list, right? And what this does, it'll kind of return each element in the list. So basically, you'll go through the, each list. You'll say, okay, first time, it'll be pens. Then the second, second time I look through, it'll be staplers. And you just look through all the items in the list. So that's a very special way you can use your for loops also. You like just look through the list. And so uh, now we can look through some examples in our CoLab notebook. Yeah, so how I like to think of lists, I kind of like, like to use the analogy of like a shopping list, right? So let's say I have a list of things I want to buy. 
or like my parents call me to buy. I don't, I, I, I'm too lazy to use the actual physical list. I kind of learned this idea of list in Python. So I want to use it to track the items I need to buy. So maybe for, for example, I start with uh, three items. I need to buy oranges, apples, and pears. So I just kind of put it like that. And so if you check our list, apple, oranges, pie, uh, pears, and then we kind of check, uh, let's say I want to check what's the first item on the list. Can anyone tell me what this returns? Anyone? Oranges, yes. So you need to keep in mind that this is a zero index. So the first item is not apples. I mean, the first item is oranges because apples is the zeroth item, right? Let's say I only want to, I need to have like certain capacity to like buy stuff. I don't have enough space in my bank for three items. I can buy two items, right? So maybe I will like get a slice of my list to of like what I need to buy. So I need to get like apples and oranges, right? Let's say, for example, I want to add elements to my items, right? Let's say suddenly I need, I ran out of bananas. I want to add items to my, my list of things I need to buy. Just append it. And so now if you check, uh, check shopping list. You can see I have four items now, right? And let's say we also ran out of dragon food, but I kind of need this like earlier. So I put it higher on the list, right? So to do that, I can use insert, insert, right? And it's now inserts itself in the second position. So zero, one, two, and it kind of pushes everything back to the back of the list, right? And so let's say maybe I add something to the list that I need to buy. I thought I need to buy, maybe I'm out of durians, right? And afterwards, I look, I look at my drawer and I found more durians. I'm like, okay, I don't need it anymore. So a very fast way to do it, you can just like pop the last element of the, of the uh, list and it kind of returns this value. And then you check the shopping list again, you realize it's no longer there, right? And you can also do pop with using uh, indexes. So let's say I want to pop the first element in the list. So I don't want, in this case, it'll be zero and then one. So it'll be oranges, right? So it returns me, and you just check your list now, it's only four items. Right. And let's say I went to get apples at the store and no longer need it, right? But I don't know, let's say this list is very long, 100 items. So I don't know which part of it, where, where in the list apples is. I can just kind of do shopping list dot remove apples. And you notice now, if I check shopping list, it's no longer there, right? And so let's say I'm not sure if I bought durians already or like it's still in my shopping list. I can kind of also check if my shopping list is very long. I can just kind of check, is it in my shopping list? And kind of say, hey, you already bought it or you already have it. There's no need to get it. And so can check. Uh, so if it is in your list, you kind of return true. So that's a very good way. If you have a very, very big list and you don't want to look through and check like a hundred items, you can just kind of check, hey, is this thing in list? Right, you can iterate through the list. And so basically, you just go through every item in the list and here it prints out what the fruit is. You can change this variable name to anything you want. So let's say I'm a bit lazy, I just call it F, right? Yeah, I know it does the same thing. You can also do having multiple items of different types here. You just change this. Notice this works. You can nest lists inside of each other. So this is kind of a list of lists, right? And so this is a bit special in terms of like, maybe let's say I want to call an item inside the list that's inside the list, right? How do I call it? So let's say I want to call um, this um, value four, right? How do I call it? I can call it using two square brackets. So instead of just using one square bracket, so this calls the first, first list of the item. So you'll call this list. And then I call one again, and then you'll call this item here. Right, so this might be a bit confusing if you're nesting a lot of lists. So it'll just be a lot of square brackets. So you need to keep in mind uh, where, like how you nest your list also, if you want to nest lists. So, yeah. Um, so let's say I want to call uh, dragon fruit, right? I'll call like three zero, right? So if let's say I want to call, for example, bananas, right? Anyone know how do I call it from another list? Three, three? Okay, let's try it. Okay, 
So what's wrong here? Yeah, so you need to remember once again, these are zero index, right? So this is zero, one, two. Yes, so the answer here is three, two. Yep. So it's a very common mistake that, you know, because when you count, you intuitively count one, two, three, right? You just think three. So it's very easy to kind of get these kind of errors when it's out of index. So usually when it's out of index, you're often like off by one. And so usually you just count, you miss the zero basically. Yep, no worries. Anyone remember when we go through a slide, what this returns? Basically, this returns a list of all the items, right? So it's this concatenation. And let's say I want to do a multiplication of this, and then I want to add together. Can anyone kind of guess what this returns? Okay, uh, so basically what this does, first thing, what is B? B will be uh, basically what is this list multiplied by three? So it'll be 21, 8, 20, 21, 21, 8, 21, 21, 8, 20, 21, three times. Yep. And then you add list A to list B, and then it will kind of give you like this. So a mix of strings and numbers, and the numbers will be that three times, right? Mm, another thing you can do with lists in Python, you can kind of call sorted, which kind of sorts everything out in alphabetical order, right? So you notice this order is different from this. That's because it kind of looks through all the items and kind of sorts it in alphabetical A, B, D, O, P, right? But you notice something is that when we called it, we kind of declared it to a different variable, right? And this is because um, for list, right? There are a lot of the functions it does is like non-destructive. So basically, uh, the original uh, list is not modified at all. You notice? So we kind of like, this returns a value. This is a function that returns a value, but it doesn't modify the, the original list. However, we can use something like numbers dot. So you notice when you use like this way of calling the function, we actually do like destructively modify the list. Right? So there are two ways of like sorting the list that either keeps the original function, uh, keeps the original like, structure of the list, so it doesn't modify the original list, and just returns a function with a modified list, or we can destructively modify the list itself. Right? So there are two ways you can kind of play around with this. All right, so down here, you can have some list exercises. We'll give you uh, maybe three minutes to kind of go through all of them, and then we'll kind of go through. These are quite simple. Right? So you'll come back at 12.05. Uh, Zoom, if anyone has any questions, just feel free to type it in chat.
Okay, so now it's 12.05. So maybe I'll just go through answers for this. Yeah, okay. So if I want to call dragon fruit, anyone know what index I call? Anyone here? Okay, so basically you count from zero, right? So zero is apple, one is oranges, and then two is dragon fruit. So if you try two, two, oh. Fruits two. Yeah, so we get dragon fruit, right? And then you can kind of assign this to a name. Right. And so if we check if it's actually true, we're gonna see it's true. Right. Another thing here, so you notice here it's uh one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, right? So the missing number here is four. So can anyone kind of tell me what the syntax it is to kind of insert four into this list? Insert three four right. So how do I type this out? Mm -hmm. Okay. Insert three four is it? Okay. So why is it three and not four? Yeah. Okay. Two. Yes. Let me just make sure this is correct. Yeah, so if you check this, so this kind of just a check to make sure it's correct. I know this is correct, right? This is true. All right, so now I'll kind of go to kind of what I introduced just now, kind of like you can loop through lists, right? So basically, a way of looping through lists like that I introduced just now is using a for loop. So I can say for element in list. And we kind of basically, this code kind of looking at the code uh, at all the numbers from 1 to 10 and checking if the modulo 2 is equal to 0, not equal to 0, right? And this means, basically, if you can't divide a number by 2, it's an odd number and just kind of add it to a list of odd numbers, right? Anyone don't understand how kind of like this code works? Anyone? So if I change this to let's say zero, equal equal to zero, can you tell me how this code will function now? Even, yeah. Okay, so you just maybe you just check put odd numbers. Yeah, you cannot see it just becomes even now. So there's another way that's uh, a bit less verbose, and you can kind of still iterate through uh, a list. And this is a bit more advanced called uh, list comprehension. And basically, instead of just doing uh, this like four line thing where you kind of look through a list, you can also like write it this way, right? We kind of say, uh, I want this value to be in our list for number in number one to ten. And so you don't really need to. Um, this is kind of a more advanced way. This works perfectly fine, but this also kind of returns a list. Oh, that's not correct. Okay. Yeah, that's correct actually. Yeah. So basically, basically it takes through the list and it kind of loops through and adds two to each value, right? You kind of get a final list that's three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and twelve. Right. So this is a bit more advanced for doing if you want to like create your so we will make your code shorter instead of like a for loop and then have to write the code one by one, right? So this is basically just a shorter way of doing this. Notice this is like four lines of code, whereas this one, you can just do everything in just a single line. Yeah. So can anyone guess what this code does? This code block.
אינו אין זום? So does it make a list of nine items or is it just multiplying the numbers itself? Multiplying items? Yes, that's right. So basically what this tells us is basically we want to check, we want to get each element in number and then multiply it by three. So this is just a short form for numbers I times three. Both are basically equivalent and this is kind of a it's just kind of a short way of saying you just put a times equal and just the value you want to times try. Right. Yeah, and that's for the most part everything you need to know about lists. Any questions about lists, like how they work, how to modify them, how to use them. Yeah, we're not covering NumPy array, but yeah, you can use NumPy arrays as well. Any other questions? Otherwise, we move on to the other built-in data structures in Python. Are lists only able to take on numbers? So no, you can see here we take in a list of strings, and here we take in a mix of strings and numbers in a single list, right? So you can kind of use lists for any item in Python, yeah. You don't need to use only numbers. Does that answer your question? Yeah, see, even here we can use lists. We can put lists itself into a big list. Yeah. And we have a mix. Yes, you can. So I think you see here, we have a mix of strings, numbers, and a list itself. So you can have a mix in the list itself. So you run this, call this, so it works completely fine, yeah. Okay, so moving on to other data structures. These are also data structures that kind of let you have a built-in collection of items basically. So these uh, tuples are sort of like lists. You can declare them instead of square brackets, you use uh, round brackets. And the main difference between tuples and lists is that once you declare items in a list, you uh, declare the items in a tuple, you can't modify them anymore. So it's kind of like a, a list that you can't modify, right? So let's say I declare a tuple, one, two, three. You can call the items inside the same way you call a list. But if you try to change the item, you know, this tuple does not support item assignment. So you can't change anything in the tuple. So this is kind of like a unmodifiable list. You can think of it. Dictionaries are a bit more special in the sense that previously both tuples and lists are kind of ordered, right? You can call them by their index 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And they're kind of like in the order you declare them. Uh, dictionaries are not ordered, but they are special because each dictionary item has what you call a key, right? And you can call so instead of like um, calling them by the number, you can call them, call them, you can call the items by the key you assign them, right? So for example, if I want to save a list of phone numbers, right? I use the I use their names as a key, and then I kind of use this colon to activate this are like a key value pair, basically. So I assign a key to a value, I assign Tom to this number, and I assign Billy to this number, right? And notice, it's not the if I call phone numbers with, so if I or for numbers. You notice it's not the order, it is order in this case, but yeah, it's not usually the order that I declared it in, right? And so if I want to call something, I just I can't call it by index. You notice you return an error, but I need to call it by the key, right? So I want to search for, let's say I want to search for Tom's phone number. Yeah, so instead of being ordered by index, this one is special in the sense that it's ordered by keys. Okay. Sets are kind of like lists, but instead they are not ordered at all. So you can kind of define them with this like curly bracket or so. Sort of like dictionaries, but instead of using this colon operator, you just call them like you, you, you would do a list. And this is good for like, you just want to do a quick search. If, let's just run all the code first. 
Yeah, so you notice it's not in the order that you declared it in. And then if you kind of just call a search in the members, you can kind of search in the values in the values, uh, in the in the list, uh, in the set itself. Yeah. And so why would we use an unordered list, right? It seems like there's less functionality. But a lot of certain operations in sets are much faster because it's not ordered. And yeah, it's much, uh, especially when you get very, very, very big values and you have link very large data, sets are useful, but you want it to be faster and you don't really need the functionality that the list provides, right? And that kind of brings us to the end of all the stuff you want to go through, right? So this is basically a lot of the fundamentals of Python. We haven't really gone through like what you can do with it, but this is basically what Essentially, all you need to know is you want to start creating anything from Python, right? So you think about it, you want to create a game, right? You think about what a game is, like a video game. It's essentially just a very big wow loop, right? Checking like, oh, if I press a button, move here, move there. If uh, an, an, enemy, an enemy attacks me and I die, you know, I break out of the loop. So that's kind of like what you can do with uh, all these um, fundamental concepts that we've taught you, right? These are some uh, after-class practices you can try. Kind of create a function. That kind of prints uh, the triangle of high end. You can use loops for this. You can also try do it in a certain way. You notice that this is like a tree instead of a triangle now. You can try to uh, try this at home. See if you can try and get it and let us know. Yeah, so, so far we've run everything in something called Google Collab, where we're not actually running locally on our computer, right? We're kind of like um, getting, we're borrowing a computer from. Google and Google kind of runs it in the cloud for us and returns us the value. So you can notice there's like RAM and this here. But uh, if you want to continue like learning Python, it's quite useful to kind of install it locally on your computer, right? So um, for purpose of this class, we kind of didn't do it locally because it takes quite a while to install everything. But if you want to get started, oh yeah, if you want to kind of get started um, learning stuff, uh, installing Python and like trying to build other stuff, this is kind of how you can install it. How do you move the drawing? Who's drawing on the screen? Uh, uh, okay, good. Yeah, so if you want to install Python locally, this is kind of where you go to. Uh, for purposes of like this workshop and like the following workshops, uh, try to install everything above Python 3 because this is kind of syntax we went through. Anything Python 2 and below kind of have a, has like slightly different syntax, so it might not work for some of the code we've run through here today. Yeah, so some things we not, did not cover in Python, but still important to know kind of they exist and you kind of read out about them. Classes and objects and how they work. Then cover about standard libraries, how to import libraries and use them. So like opening files and stuff. We didn't cover about like Python environments and type hinting, right? So these are some of some things you can kind of, if you are interested to know more, you can read out on, on them. And these are kind of essential if you want to build your own projects in Python, right? So uh, what's next for our Hacker School workshop? So I believe this is next week, right? So next week, we'll kind of start with like some stuff about automation with Python, how we can automate some stuff to make it uh, easier. There's Telegram bots. You can learn how to create a Telegram bot using... So basically, all of this course is kind of based off these fundamental concepts that we've taught you today, right? And so with all these fundamental concepts, you can kind of start building some um, cool stuff with Python, right? So you can do data wrangling and visualization with pandas. And data visualizing and data visualization and with like Python and Tableau. Yeah, and so that's kind of the end of our workshop. Uh, those of you here, you can try and get the QR code and do our post workshop survey. I'll post this in the Zoom chat so everyone in Zoom chat also can look through. Uh, anyone else have any like questions? Yeah, and our sign up link is here. Yes. Uh, so the immediate next workshop will be on the twenty seventh of August. Okay. So next, basically next week, and basically the rest of that will come will be on Saturdays as well, right? 
Mm. Uh, the link to the slide will kind of post it uh, once at the end of the session. We'll kind of like, give everyone the slides afterwards. Yeah. So this, I think, is in sequential order in terms of the next few Saturdays. Yeah. So this will be next Saturday, and then this will be the following Saturday, so on and so forth. Yeah. Aside from that, yeah, thank you all of you from coming down this Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon now. Yep. Yeah, thank you very much for coming down. We hope you've learned something. I'll full stop the recording actually. Yeah, I think we will share the recording with you all also in the future. Like once we are done. Uh slides. Do you want to give them now? Okay, okay. We'll we'll tidy up the slides and then you'll send to all the participants. Don't worry.